This week's podcast is proudly sponsored by the Denon Home Wireless Speaker Range. With Denon Home, you can upgrade to high res wireless sound and stream your favorite music effortlessly throughout your home. Experience impressive acoustic performance based on 110 years of sound innovation with special offers now available at authorized Denon retailers. Find out more at denon.com forward slash Denon Home. Hello and welcome to the Forums podcast, streaming live on the 25th of November. And joining me in this edition, Steve Withers. What really matters is what you like, not what you are like. Ed Selly. This evening we will be Barry Jive and the Uptown Five. And Tom Davies. It's brilliant being depressed. You can behave as badly as you like. <laughs> Hello, good evening, and welcome along if you're watching us live on the YouTube live stream. Thank you very much for joining us. It is appreciated. If you're listening a little bit later on in the week, it's also appreciated that you're either watching us or listening to us. And of course, you can find the podcast on providers such as iTunes, Spotify, and so on. And if you're watching us on YouTube, don't forget, you can hit that like button. The like button is very, very important. Uh, Please click that this evening if you can. It helps uh, the video get found in YouTube, because there's lots of videos on YouTube, seemingly. Uh, Also, hit the uh, notification bell to be informed every time we upload new videos. And of course, if you appreciate what we do here, our editorial, our forums, videos, and everything else, you can make a donation. You can do that two ways. Uh, We've launched our Patreon campaign at patreon.com forward slash AV forums. If you want to automatically support us, it's £3 per month. Uh, You can head over there and sign up now. But if you've got any questions this evening and you want to draw our attention to them uh, because they pop up on screen and we can see them, then you can also make a donation through Streamlabs. It's streamlabs.com forward slash AV forums. You can make a donation of any size you like. And like I say, it's a perfect way to get your question noticed. And since we were last here live, we have a new patron, Daniel Higginbotham. Uh, Thank you very much for becoming a patron. It is appreciated. And of course, by supporting us through donations and so on, you help us grow AV forums, improve the site speed and features. We can produce more editorial content like news and reviews. And of course, we can do more videos. And one day we'll do the perfect podcast like the perfect lap. So thank you very much for your support. I'm not going to ask the guys what they'll be doing this week because like the rest of us, nothing. (laughs) Sitting in the house, twiddling thumbs. and I really wish in my case that would be unusual. but uh, (laughs) That's just a normal week, yeah, I know. I'm almost the same as you, Steve. Almost the same. Um, Right, so we're going to jump straight into current competitions because we've got a special guest this evening uh, who will be turning up very, very soon. So Steve, take us through the competitions, please. Well, in no particular order by the looks of it. <laughs> um, you can win a copy of Le Cirque Rouge on Blu-ray. That closes on the 17th of December. You can win a copy of The Last Christmas on DVD and the soundtrack CD. And that closes on the 2nd of December. You can win a copy of April on Blu-ray, which closes on the 17th of December. You can win a copy of King of New York on 4K Ultra HD Blu-ray. Excellent disc. I've seen it myself. Uh, and that closes on the 18th of December. You can win a copy of The Evil Dead on 4K Ultra HD Blu-ray. I see the review went up today. Um, quite tempted by that one, I have mm. to say. Um, and that closes on 10th of December. And you can win a copy of Westworld Season 3, The New World on 4K Blu-ray. And that closes on the 12th of December. You can win a Sharp HTSBW800 Dolby Atmos soundbar with a wireless subwoofer worth 449 English pounds. British pounds, should I say? Uh, And that closes on 15th December. Excellent prize. Um, I reviewed that product. It's really good. It's one of our award winners and uh, definitely want to enter for that one. You win a copy of Children of Dune on Blu-ray. I watched that at the weekend, funnily enough. Not that actual disc, but my copy. Uh, And that closes on the 5th of December. Another good prize. You can win a copy of The Lady Killers. Absolute classic film. Another great prize. And that's on 4K Ultra HD Blu-ray. And that closes on the 5th of December. You can win a copy of the Criterion Collection's November titles on Blu-ray. That's The Irishman, Five Easy Pieces and Girlfriends. And that closes on the 3rd of December. You can win a Lionsgate Cult Classics bun- Blu-ray bundle, which is uh, Last Exit Brook, Brooklyn, Snowpiercer, Reservoir Dogs, American Psych- Psycho and Requiem for a Dream. That's a cracking mm. collection of films there. All good. All good. Uh, definitely worth entering that competition. And that closes on the 26th of November. So you better get a, you better do that right now. <laughs> Stop watching this, enter the competition, come back in a minute. Because <laughs> that closes tomorrow. Uh, and no, no, you can no, win no. A... don't stop watching. No. <laughs> well, you can do two things, can't you? You can watch this and you can enter the competition. You can multitask on this one. Come on, guys. That's what I'm doing for most of this podcast. 
Uh, you can win a pair of Philips Fidelio X3 headphones worth £299, and that closes on the 1st of December. All competitions are open to eligible AB Forums members resident in the UK. Another award winner there, the mm, Fidelio. Yes, another, yes award another award winner. Yeah, good stuff. Um, Patreon exclusives, Steve. Patreon exclusive. You can win a copy of Back to the Future on HMV exclusive 4K Blu-ray steelbook Japanese artwork. Woohoo. Uh, and that closes, again, I've seen the discs, they are superb. Uh, closes on the 4th of December. And you can win a copy of The Sun's Room on Blu-ray. Uh, closes 17th of December. Podcast exclusive. Uh, the podcast exclusive is when, when you can win three, no, hang on, you can win Royal Three DVD collection. Oh, I see. Royal Three DVD collection. Emma, Downton Abbey, the movie, and Mary, Queen of Scots. Um, I don't think Emma's going to do a royalty, is it? You can, uh, you can enter that and Nan. That's pushing it. <laughs> I mean, but that's the podcast exclusive. We've got royal, royalty adjacent, and then royalty nowhere in sight. Yeah, yeah. Diminishing it's, it, Well, it's DVD, so it is for your granny, really. <laughs> <laughs> and our previous competition winner, Steve. Yeah, uh, Thailander won the podcast exclusive competition to win a copy of Tremors, Shrieker Island on Blu-ray. Jat82, or J-A-T-82, depending on how you pronounce it, won the podcast exclusive competition to win a copy of El Camino, a Breaking Bad movie on Blu-ray. Great prize there. Camelot 1971. Is he a fan of the film? Possibly. <laughs> uh, won a copy of the HMV exclusive Japanese original poster design artwork, limited edition still, blimey, limited edition still book, Blu-ray disc of Robert <laughs> Wise's 1975 George C. Scott starring disaster movie, The Hindenburg. I'm going to pass out now. I'm trying to say that. <laughs> that's, that's a Kaz sentence for you. Dear. Yeah. Yeah. Has he ever heard <laughs> Classic of Classic Hartration? That's good. It tells you everything you need to know. Yes. Yes. It tells you more than you need to know, to be perfectly honest, because he's won it. So, yeah, you got a prize, mate. Congratulations. Well done. Yeah. I don't think you were supposed to read the whole thing out. But anyway. Uh, well, so I, got, I got going. And as I got going, I thought, hang on, what's going on? This is never going to win. <laughs> right. So that's competition stuff. Uh, get oh, I'm off for a cup of tea, then I might know. Well, I'm gonna be <laughs> well, well yeah, done. You and me both, Steve. You and me both. Yeah. Well done if you're a winner there. And uh, yeah, competition page. Go check it out. Right. Okay. We will be back with hardware in a second. So as you can see, Tom has morphed into somebody else. Uh, welcome to the podcast, please. Chris Mullins from Sony Professional Europe. Good evening, Chris. Hey, Phil. Yeah, thank you very much for having me on, on the podcast tonight. So we were uh, discussing just before we came on, it's two years since we last uh, spoke to each other because um, it's two years since you last uh, launched a projector product and you yes. are responsible for that product line. So maybe you could tell people a little bit about your background, what your job is and, and what you do. Yeah, so yeah, I'm Chris Mullins and I work for Sony Professional Solution Europe as the product manager for our home cinema projector uh, lineup. Um, so I've been actually at Sony for... Uh, actually 12 years now and for most of that I've kind of looked after projection so I've been doing home cinema for the last three or so years now uh, and then before that I looked after our digital cinema uh, projector lineup so really a projector guy through and through on the Sony side. I also so it's not just projectors is it you'd also do um, some other bits and pieces don't you? Uh, yeah, so um, I look after, well, it's predominantly projection, but I look after home cinema, I look after visual uh, simulation and visual entertainment as well. So it's kind of other applications for projectors as well. So right. like planetariums and simulation as well. So the B2B side of that projector business as well. Okay, excellent. Right. So new projectors, we didn't have IFA this year, it was all online. Um, but you did launch new product, there was three new products. So perhaps you could take us through what those products were. And, uh, and then we can get into it in a little bit more detail. Yeah, sure. So um, yeah, we we're very excited this year to bring actually um, three yeah, brand new products to uh, to our home cinema lineup uh, this year. Uh, as you mentioned, we did manage to do that last year. So it's quite exciting to do it this year. Um, and we had kind of two core main products and then also a, a brand new flagship from Sony. So from our core lineup range, we had the VW590, uh, which is our native 4K uh, 1800 lumen um, 
lamp projector and it's priced at um well retails at around seven thousand pounds so this is actually the uh follow-up to our vw 570 so if you know our product range uh, well this is the successor to that model which is actually priced at 8k so this product comes in at a thousand pounds cheaper than that previous model uh, and it includes all the benefits of that previous model so um, all the picture positioning advanced iris for contrast and various other things but with this new product we've also introduced a brand new picture processing unit so this is the x1 for projector which has a number of different advantages uh, which I can go through in a bit more detail in, in a minute. Um, and alongside that, we also had the 790. So this is our native 4K 2000 lumen uh, projection system, um, which retails at um, 12,000 pounds. So this again is the follow up to our VW 760, which was at 15,000 pounds. So again, it's kind of come down in price as these technologies become more, uh, more mainstream over time and it's becoming a bit more accessible to have those kind of premium lamp and laser based home projection systems. Um, over time and again it includes that brand new x1 uh, projector x1 for projector processing uh, chipset uh, as well um, and then the final product we also have is our um, our gtz uh, vpl gtz 380 which is our brand new uh, flagship projector um, and with with the flagship uh, from Sony, we always try and kind of redefine what's possible with with projection. And with this one, we think we've really created like the first true HDR projector. So it's super bright, 10,000 lumens, but also it's high contrast, high resolution, 4K, native 4K still, as well as um, uh, full DCI P3 color space as well. So um, yeah, some a lot, lot of exciting products uh, uh, there to be. Um, Chris, did you give us pricing on the 790 and the GT? Yes, yes. So the 790 is 12,000 pounds, kind of retails around 12,000 pounds. And then this, the uh, GTZ 380 is a flagship. So it's kind of, if you have to ask, <laughs> maybe you can't afford it, <laughs> I don't know. But um, it's, uh, it's around uh, 80,000 pounds. For, for that unit so it really is for that top niche that demands it's, it's more of a professional product that one is it because it's yeah one of the unique things with sony and why you were able to come to market quite quickly with uh, home native projectors is that obviously you have a whole professional line you also supply cinemas with their digital projection units as well yeah yeah sure yeah so we have a lot of a lot of fingers in a lot of pies in in sony um and especially on on the professional side um yeah and the the gtz uh, 380 is yeah our flagship product for residential and and professional so um it will be used not only in residential home cinemas but also in uh, top end planetariums or also um flight simulators professional simulation where they demand the highest quality large screen images um, this is um, where that, that will be um, sold into. Okay. And, and, you know, without giving away trade secrets and all the rest of it, what is it that you're actually getting for your £80,000? I mean, where, where is yeah. the, what is it that actually makes it worth that or, or cost that? So, yeah, I mean, it, it's, yeah, as I said, it's, it's kind of our first true kind of HDR, I think the first true HDR projector. So when you talk about HDR uh, with projection, it comes with a, a number of caveats with regards to brightness and, and various other things that um, maybe you don't get with, with some panel technologies. But with this projector, it's, it's 10,000 lumens to start. And for home cinema residential use, that is quite um, rare, actually, that, that level of, of brightness. With that brightness, you can actually hit... Um, eight meter screens at 30 foot Lamberts. Um, if you decide to, and if you had a room big enough for, you could do that. Or, but what we would probably recommend is using it on a three, four, five meter screen and having a uh, true HDR brightness. So you can actually achieve more than 500 nits on the screen uh, on those large screen sizes. So that's where it really does change what's possible with projectors. Cause normally you're always talking about, oh, I've got hundred nits on screen or 200 nits on screen. This one will be um, able to deliver the same brightnesses as what you get from like a, an OLED panel, for example. But alongside that HDR isn't just about brightness. It's about that resolution. It's also about contrast and about color. And because it uses uh, SXRD, you get the really deep uh, blacks and high contrast you expect with um, SXRD. So, um, and that is not common at all on high brightness projectors. There's plenty of 10,000 lumen business projectors or 
uh, LCD or DLP projectors, which are very high brightness. But um, yeah, they do not have the same level of black level as maybe you can get with SXRD. So, and that's what really delivers your dynamic range is that contrast performance. So if you have contrast, you have high brightness. And then the third aspect is, is color. Um, and the GTZ380 can cover 100% DCI P3 color space, um, which um, is kind of the, the color space used uh, by film, uh, film producers in the cinema industry. Um, and this, uh, this isn't all that uncommon. There's quite a few projectors that can do that. But the unique thing with this one is, is that it doesn't require any filtering. So you actually get 100% brightness and 100% of the color. Uh, without any compromise, because sometimes you have to choose between whether you want full colors or full brightness with projectors. So with this, we've completely redesigned the laser light engine to introduce another red laser. So it's kind of an RB laser light engine um, that um, basically takes away the need to do that filtering for that wider color space. So yeah, all in all, uh, really delivers color volume basically on screen. Yeah. Okay, so we'll get our Euro Millions uh, tickets ready. For the <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> so, so let just coming back Sorry, down to the question. Yeah, yeah, question. yes, please. Um, no, just uh, the two seventy. Uh, is yeah. that not being replaced this year? With is it no, um, yeah. So, so this year, no. The, the two seventy is main re remaining in our lineup, and just just to remind people, the VW two seventy is our kind of entry level native four K uh, projector. So it is. Um, uh, yeah, it is the entry point, the, the basically the most affordable I, native 4K projector it, out there. Absolutely. But That's still making it, we're still it's still affordable. Yeah, but there's no revision um, with this with this at this particular time. Uh, yeah, so far. So yeah, the next step up is then that 590. It did recently win um, product of the year again um, by by What Hi Fi. So um, it got um, two years in a row now. So it really is kind of a pred pedigree product that particular um, entry level 4K machine. Okay, so let's move on to uh, this year's new product. Um, let's start with the the entry level. I'm saying entry level; it's still nearly eight thousand pounds, but yeah, <laughs> it's, <laughs> well, it's yeah, a new model for this year. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So it's a new it's a new model for this year. So why do you tell us a little bit more about the the five ninety ES? <laughs> Yeah, well, to be honest with you, with the 590 and, and the 790, um, they're similar to their previous generation projectors in terms of core device characteristics, so in terms of brightness and contrast and that. But the main thing that we're changing this year is the, the picture processing. So what we have um, this year is the X1 for projector processor. And this is the first time um, we've... Um, We've launched kind of an X1 for projector chipset, which has been specifically designed uh, from from the X1 uh, from out from our Bravia range. Um, so, and that comes with a lot of advantages. So, the two the two core things that it really improves this time round are. Uh, the HDR experience with a brand new picture processing called uh, Dynamic HDR Enhancer and also an improvement to our reality creation. So it improves our kind of 4K clarity on screen as well with this with this um, new picture processor. Um, so to, to go into a bit more detail about the Dynamic HDR Enhancer. So um, this is a, yeah, a frame by frame enhancement optimization for HDR. So it's basically dynamic uh, tone mapping as, as people may know from uh, from within the industry. Um, and it, it really is a step change in HDR performance from previous generations. So as I mentioned before, there are challenges in HDR with brightness levels and giving that impression of specular highlights when you don't have that peak brightness. Um, so what this does, it really optimizes, especially dark scenes, um, the HDR performance. And it does it in kind of three, three ways. Uh, the first one is, um, it has a much uh, greater ability to analyze HDR scenes, actually, as much more tonal resolution. So when it's looking at HDR content, it can actually identify many, many more tones in the shadows and the highlights. Um, and then with that analysis, uh, we utilize that to brighten the particular highlights or HDR specular highlights and various things around HDR that we want to enhance very specifically. Uh, and then alongside that, we can use precision dimming to um, lower the overall black level. So we're doing kind of two things. We're kind of targeting the bright areas with signal processing and using precision dimming on the low end uh, to lower the black level. So we really are looking to expand 
the dynamic range with this processing and that's what we're visually aiming for um, with this with this um, with this processing is to give you that HDR projector experience HDR experience with projection we're not looking just to um, make things a bit more SDR we want to make it more HDR should we say and how exactly is it doing that is it looking at things like histograms and so on a few frames ahead and working it out that way Yes, yeah. So uh, we're not actually utilizing uh, metadata in this analysis. Yeah, it's using uh, yeah, it's using the histogram, as you said. So it's looking at all the different brightness level of the content. Um, yeah, a few frames ahead, um, and we'll then optimize them uh, dynamically. Um, yeah, scene by scene. So the, the the key thing with and with dynamic tone mapping and what's useful. Uh, for the end user is it's kind of a set and forget function. I mean, in the past with projectors, sometimes you've had to completely change the way your projector is configured for each different type of content that you're watching. But with dynamic tone mapping, you can uh, limit your, your need to do that as much. It's about yeah, setting it once and then the projector does the clever things in analyzing the scenes and, and really giving you the best HDR experience. Um, and kind of Sony, Sony's approach with this may be a little bit different in terms of dynamic tone mapping to maybe other impl implementations of this, of this kind of process. So, so Sony's way of doing it is based, basically um, trying to give the HDR impact to the viewer. So what did the director intend with the HDR um, when, it, when it's grading, when they're grading HDR. And this is where Sony, as we mentioned at the start, has quite a lot of advantages. We, we have kind of our fingers, yeah, throughout the content chain, we have a picture studio, we have the cinematography cameras, we have the grading uh, monitors that we all produce. So we, we understand how stuff is captured in HDR, how it's graded in HDR, and then how it should look in, in HDR based on the director's intent. So what we actually did a while, well, I say what we, what our engineers and the clever people at Sony did uh, in Japan uh, was they actually uh, used a grading monitor as the reference when they were uh, optimizing this particular um, HDR enhancement. So they had uh, HDR content on a, on a reference monitor, and then they're looking to reflect that as closely as possible within the dynamic range of a projector to give that content creator's intent. So um, it it may uh, so it may result in a slightly different feel to other dynamic tone mapping um, technologies, which may be prioritize keeping every tone in the image rather than the intent of the image, if that makes sense. So um, that's where it, it may differ, but ultimately. It's been kind of Sony's long-term goal is to kind of deliver that that filmic and that that intent from the director. So obviously the the um, the five ninety is a bulb based projector, but the yes. seven ninety is actually laser based. So what are the differences between the two, and why have you gone for for different techniques with the two? Yeah. So um, yeah. So it gives it gives a number of um, a number of options for the consumer. So our our premium laser uh, projectors come at a, a premium price point, you could say as well. So offering a lamp as well offers enables us to offer a, a greater range of, of products. But from Sony, we have really a, a core platform of of kind of processing. So the processing between the five ninety and seven ninety uh, is is essentially the same. The difference is is the light engines, as you say. So uh, for the uh, 590, you have a lamp and an iris, and then for the 790, you have uh, a laser and an iris as well. Um, and um, laser really gives you a lot of benefits, I think. And I think it really is, for, on, on the premium side, gives you a huge number of like operational and picture quality benefits. So on the operational side, you've got that 20,000 hours of, of um, light source life down to 50% brightness. Um, and that gives you a very consistent image quality for the long, long term. So, Sorry. So for regards to brightness, um, you have consistent brightness for its operational life, as well as consistent colors. So um, with, with lamp base over the course of a few thousand hours, the color temperature can change, for example, you don't get the same impact with laser. Um, and um, also there's some operational things, you don't need to worry about lamp changes, you don't need to worry about filter changing changes, everything's sealed in, in these laser projectors. Um, and 
in the current way we watch content like streaming content, Netflix and various things, we also have, um, it's also very easy to use. It's fast on and fast off. So you can actually, from powering it on to get an image full brightness on screen is only uh, around 30 seconds. So it really fits in with that kind of lifestyle, how, how we all use and consume content these days as well, having, having laser. Okay, let's take a couple of questions that are in the chat window. Um, I don't know if you've had a, a chance to look at those, Chris. Uh, but Gustavo says, um, how do you convince an owner of a 760 ES to upgrade to the 70, 790 ES? Is there a big difference doing that? Um, yeah, I mean, f for me personally, I, I've tested them side by side, and it really is down to the the, the HDR processing. So uh, for me, it was really night and night and day. You, you can see see the difference um, quite clearly. Um, so when you're looking in HDR content in those dark scenes in particular, you get a real impact with this HDR um, dynamic HDR enhancer, this frame by frame tone mapping. It is um, it is a, an evolution, I think. Um, in image quality. So um, the 760 is still a fantastic machine. I mean, it delivers uh, images uh, on screen that really, uh, really amaze. But I think if, if HDR is your priority and you want the best image possible, then yeah, I really think the 790 is a, is a great step forward. And I, I do believe it is, it is an upgrade as well. Steve? Yeah. Would, um, would Sony consider, I mean, we could talk about the difference between 760 and 790 or 560 and 590. I mean, would, would you ever consider taking a similar approach to JVC and offering firmware updates rather than releasing a whole new range? Yeah, so, so we've done that. We've done it in the past. So, for example, last year we released um, a new firmware that activated, for example, the, the Iris uh, or enabled the Iris and some other things in our 760 and 5000 units last year. Um, this year, though, um, unfort well, I say unfortunately, uh, basically it was a hardware change. So there is a new chipset inside. So it's this new X1 processor for prefer projector um, and so it's a little difficult <laughs> to implement hardware uh, via firmware update so unfortunately in this case it's a bit a bit of a challenge but yeah we do we do value um, supporting um, our, our projectors for the long term um, but yeah in this case a firmware update wouldn't wouldn't be possible what's the um, claimed um, camera coverage for the 790 because it's using lasers. Uh, so, yeah, so it's, it's using it's using laser. It uses a laser phosphor engine. Um, so uh, I don't think we publish precisely the the gamut coverage, um, but it's in it's in the ninety plus coverage of DCI-P3. Um, I think in terms of coverage, uh, it's triluminous. Um, we use our triluminous colors. So with with Sony again, we're looking to deliver. Um, a balance of image quality. We want to give you brightness and colors. So um, we we could implement a DCI color filter in all our on all our projectors, for example. But that comes at a cost of of brightness. So what you get with triluminous colors is a real balance of of color and brightness performance on screen to give you a natural natural feel on screen. Okay. Well. Steve and myself are taking these projectors in. I've got the 590 coming on Friday, and yeah, Steve's got the 790 coming on Friday. So we're both going to have a weekend of Sony projectors. What is it that you think uh, we're going to notice uh, against the older the older machines that we've previously reviewed? Yeah, I think it's the yeah, it's it's the the feel of the the dynamic range. Yeah, you you'll be you'll be surprised. Um, the the physical background of the projectors haven't haven't changed a huge amount. It's the same same chassis, same same power, same lumens out there, but same lenses, the imp same lenses as well. Yep, same lenses as well. So um, it really is down to the processing, but the processing can have such a huge huge impact on image quality. So um, again, I don't wanna don't wanna sound like a broken record, but I think the HDR performance is is what really drives it this year. Okay, well, yep. uh, sorry, one question, Phil. Are the HDMI ports um, fully spec'd? So wow. yeah, so the HDMI are 2.0B, yes. So they can um, they can show up to 4K 60p in um, HDR. So yeah, we've had a lot of questions this year, especially with some other Sony products being released. You may have heard of with the PS5 <laughs> uh, being HDMI 2.1. 
Um, and actually, luckily, I was lucky enough to actually get a pre-order unit, not through Sony, but through everyone else the public way <laughs> of getting <laughs> one. To be fair, it's not, it's not a good look. If you, you, so, so you, you get you actually, automatic. You yeah. actually got one, you got one in the box and you didn't get another item sent through instead. No, I didn't get a tin of beans or a teddy bear or whatever it is. Yeah, <laughs> that's that's I did, yeah. <laughs> but um, yeah, I, I think with, with the latest generation of consoles, I think when, when people actually get their hands on them or more people get hands on them, they'll realize that um, the real benefit of these latest consoles is having true 4K, native 4K at 60p. Um, and in previous generations of consoles, it's been kind of 4K upscaled at 30p. And with this new with PS5 and, and also the Xbox Series X, um, they're really making 4K 60p the standard. And Sony projectors can deliver that 4K native 60p um, at 27 milliseconds input lag, which is basically the same as our TVs. Um, so you really do get that large screen immersive experience um, in your cinema as, as you would on, on a large screen Bravia as well. So um, it doesn't have the 120p that so many people are looking for, but I think if you're really into your 120p, you're probably going to use a, a gaming monitor and uh, yeah. maybe not maybe not your cinema. So maybe it's a bit of a yeah. niche thing, the 4K 120. Okay, well, um, we're going to have to cut it short at that point, Chris, but thank you very much for coming on the podcast. I know myself and Steve are looking forward to uh, looking at the products and reviewing them over the next couple of weeks. So uh, dark nights are here. Excuses, you know, we're still in lockdown, so we don't need yeah, any well, excuses to sit. They're legitimately entitled to sit there watching yeah, and watch films. Yeah, images. Exactly. Which is exactly what I'm going to do. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So uh, we shall get you on probably in the new year, Chris, and, and go through uh, stuff again. But thank you very much for joining us this evening on the podcast. Perfect. Thank you very much for having me, guys. Thanks, Thank Chris. You. Cheers, Chris. Cheers, Chris. Cheers. Cheers. Right. So what we need to do now is we need to move on and talk about some hi-fi. We don't talk about enough about hi-fi. Well, this is this is this is the extended, the extended, you know, director's yeah, cut. Extended of hi-fi. Director's <laughs> cut. Yeah. In HDR. So uh Editor's Choice Awards, we don't need to go into too much detail on this one. Um, because obviously the article is out there, it's on the homepage, uh, ready for everybody to have a, a quick read through. Uh, but just quickly, let's go over um, the products, what you awarded, and, and, and so on. Yes, All right. as before, um, same rules as uh, Steve went through last week with the podcast, had to be reviewed, uh, not necessarily in 2020, but realistically between November 2019 and, well, the dead end of October. Um, which one or two products actually did just creep in. Um, so this means that we can't go back. It's always about looking at what we've done this year rather than, um, than, than sort of just awarding the same thing over and over again. It is a nature of how we award our, our awards that we, we, you don't get repeat winners. So with that in mind, it was a good year for, for Hi-Fi. And um, uh, thankfully, uh, more by accident than design, a good spread of price points as well. Um, I mean, I do try and make sure that we get some affordable things go through, but um, it's as much as luck as anything that some of those affordable things this year were absolutely brilliant. So, right, starting off, best hi-fi speaker under a thousand pounds. That's the Mission LX2 Mark II. Um, this is 220 pounds and uh, it moves the performance on from the original LX2 by, you know, in some in some useful detailed ways, but it also manages to do that whilst looking and feeling considerably more expensive than it is. Um, it's that reason really why it um, got the award under a thousand pounds because it simply feels, looks, feels, and behaves like a speaker that costs far more than it does. Um, it's a, a genuinely unprecedented level of, of, you know, overall presentation that even a couple of years ago, you just simply wouldn't get at this price point, even with, and I went into the review of this at long point, um, uh, that even though inflation means that these speakers, you know, 30 years ago, when we were still making 220 pound loudspeakers, these speakers would have cost about 95 pounds. It's an outstanding achievement, really well done mission. Moving on, uh, a little bit more expensive. Uh, best hi-fi speaker, a thousand pounds to three thousand pounds. Bose and Wilkins seven hundred five signature. This was one that crept in just under the uh, the, the deadline for for getting getting coverage. Um, absolutely outstanding product. The seven hundred two signature, the floor standard, is a really really good product. This is a great one. Um, 
the things that make products great are intangible, but it simply is an it's a joy to listen to. It's a joy to look at. I mean, you know, appearance is subjective, but you f you really can't argue with the way that it's bolted together and finished. Um, and it just makes listening to whatever you choose to listen to. And believe you me, I put it th I put it through some really weird ends of of the music collection. It just delivered all of them in a in a truly fab fab fabulous way. And the other thing is, uh, you know, again, not too much detail. We. Bowers and Wilkins has had an interesting year. They now got a new a new owner. Um, this is just a reminder that when they choose to make a pair of stereo loudspeakers, they, you know, the, the, everyone else needs to sit up and pay attention. This is arguably the best speaker I've I've, I've tested at this price point. Not just this year, just full stop. Um, on that note, moving further up the list, uh, speaker over three thousand pounds was the Kudos Titan 505. Uh, this is a tricky one because really, unless you sit down and listen to these, I'm so, I always feel that I'm slightly laboring. Uh, you know, it's, it's, the looks are a, a matter of personal opinion. I think that it looks fantastic. Many people in the comments thread made it abundantly clear that they feel otherwise. Um, it's a small, it's a, a speaker from a small company. So there are certain tricks of finish and so on and so forth that simply aren't practical to do. But I, I, as I said in the, the awards copy, I said in the review itself, I've tested more expensive speakers than this one. I've tested more sophisticated speakers than this one. I have never tested a better speaker than this one. Uh, it is simply put the most compelling musical experience that I, you know, I can remember spending any meaningful time with. It is an absolute joy. Um, and you know it, it it's got some unusual uh flexible features which i'm going to be covering in a slightly different way in a review that's coming up um it does things that almost no other speaker can do and i've arranged to demonstrate what those things are um but even if you don't want to make use of any of those things it's just a fabulous fabulous product and, and one that i thoroughly enjoyed uh spending time with right that speaker's done hold on let me uh, work out where we go next because i can only memorize three products at a time i'm afraid because you know my, my mind is somewhat fractured these days turntables uh, i didn't look at as many of these uh this year um because you know i'm i'm conscious that that they are they're a niche element of av forums however if you are looking for an affordable turntable the t1 phono uh, which I looked at earlier this year is two hundred and thirty nine pounds, and it it's like the mission. It is unreasonably brilliant for two hundred and forty quid. Uh, I think the the phono one might be fractionally more expensive than that. There's the the basic one is is, is two hundred and forty, and they and they they go up. There's one with phono stage, and there's one with Bluetooth. But all of them look better than any affordable project turntable I've. Um, tested up until this point they're built better than any affordable project turntable i've used up until this point and most importantly they sound better they are genuinely lovely things to listen to um there's an element with um some of these affordable designs and this is no exception where they've reduced the scope to up grade them and, and change parts further on because realistically most owners are not going to do that the the, the, the benefit of this is that it's incredibly simple to set up and it just everything just works together exceptionally well. Um, it's one of those products where it doesn't have to make excuses for the price it comes in at. It's a genuinely compelling way of, of, of listening to records. I, I thoroughly enjoyed the, the time the time I spent with it. And it's a demonstration that Project has decided once again, just to remind people that they are a big deal. And when they choose to make something, they can do a tremendously good job of it. Um, further up the uh, food chain, best turntable a thousand pounds and over, uh, Rager Planer 10. This was a bit of a no brainer, really. It's in some regards, it's exactly like the project. It is incredibly easy to set up and use for what is a comparatively high-end turntable. I mean, with the cartridge, it's uh, four and a half thousand pounds. Without the cartridge, it's three thousand six hundred pounds. If you buy it with the Riga Feta cartridge fitted, it is no harder to put together, really, than any other Riga turntable at any price point. Um, you will not herniate yourself getting it out of the box. Uh, it doesn't need an enormous amount of space. It's incredibly easy to live with and then goes on to deliver a genuinely high-end listening experience. Um, 
it's a hard one to describe because it really doesn't put a great deal of itself into what it does. It's a, you know, you, what you get is an unvarnished take on, on the record itself, but it's still tremendously compelling with that. And uh, as I mentioned in the text, Riga has very kindly allowed this plane attend. It's lived here with me since it's done its review um, as a piece of test equipment, because when I write in a review, I connected it to, I can then write Riga Plane the Ted and link straight to the review rather than a polyglot collection of bits, which is, my, you know, one of the other turntables that lives here. In that time, it's been moved around, it's been hot plugged, it's been uh, moved from location to location, taken apart, um, put back together again. It hasn't missed a beat. It is a tremendously tremendously clever product and one that realistically you can buy in the full knowledge that it's going to pretty much last you the rest of your natural life um moving on to all in ones morant's melody uh, we, we never got to the bottom whether it's the melody x or the melody 10 um this is a genuine surprise because i didn't have any particularly preconceived ideas about whether this was going to be good or not um, and also it feels in when you take it out the box, it's sort of archaic. It's, it's the same sort of pattern that we've been doing mini systems uh, to for, you know, over 20 years. It's got a CD player at the front. It's got an FM radio and all the rest of it. But they've Marantz has bolstered the classic features with their HEOS um, streaming system they share with Denon. Uh, it's got DAB. It's got Internet radio. It's got digital inputs. Um, and more than any of those things, it sounds unreasonably good. Uh, I mean, whether unreasonably is the correct, is, is the word that you'd necessarily be looking for. It just delivered far more than I thought it was going to. Um, it's a genuinely lovely product to listen to. Uh, compared, combined with something like the Missions, if you are on a particularly tight budget, or something like the Triangle Barriers, which I tested this year, which would still keep you well under a thousand pounds. It's not good for the money it's a you know it's something that's really enjoyable to listen to and gets an enormous amount done um you can use the optical inputs to connect it to a television and i'd certainly give it the nod over some of the sort of more lifestyle sound bars at the business of reproducing the television stuff let alone doing that the, the music business um moving on uh, this is the first time I think I've ever awarded an award to a product which is, as far as the manufacturer is concerned, is <laughs> not this product. Uh, the Arcam SA30, uh, I need to be absolutely clear on this, is not, as far as Arcam is concerned, an all-in-one system, except it quite blatantly is. Um, it's a, uh, it's an, amp an integrated amplifier, but it has streaming on board. Uh, it has all the connectivity you could reason reasonably want to then attach other things, but it doesn't need anything other than speakers to do what it does. Um, and thanks to the fact it's got Dirac and, 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 and proper, you know, full uh, 20, 20 hertz to 20 kilohertz to Dirac, it is outstandingly capable. Um, and it, it should be seen as an all-in-one system because it doesn't need anything else to do what it does, as opposed to the amplifiers, which we'll come to. Um, like Steve reviewing his Arcan products last week, we didn't get these products until I suspect some of the more onerous issues had been ironed out on them. So I am aware that there are owners who have found this product to be a frustrating experience. We can only review what we get. And what I got was a superb and very, very well thought amplifier um, that, as I say, doesn't need anything else. So in, in the context of how things were reviewed this year, it, it gained the all-in-one system award for reasons that we'll come to. Moving on to amplifiers themselves, uh, best amplifier under a thousand pounds by the distance of the earth to the sun is the Riga IO. Uh, this is a tiny little thing. It can sit on a, page, a piece of A4 paper. Um, but in miniature, it's everything that a Riga amplifier should be. It's incredibly engaging to listen to. It has an excellent phono stage waiting for a turntable to be connected. It has enough connectivity. It has three analog inputs. Um, and fundamentally speaking, if you think about what a DAC, which you're likely to connect to it, will then do in its own way, it's generally enough for most people to get things done. A uh, decent headphone amplifier as well. It's made out of metal. It's beautifully made. And more than any of these things, it just sounds unreasonably good. 
for for the cost uh i i adore this product it's everything that affordable hi-fi should be because as well as doing all of the tick box things it makes you feel happy using it and listening to it uh further up the food chain best hi-fi amplifier a thousand pounds three thousand pounds more by accident than design i ended up testing a lot of amplifiers in this category and the one that eventually triumphs and it is a points victory this is not a decisive one uh name nate xs3 the long and the short of it is that the xs3 is 90 plus percent as good as the supernate three which costs three and a half thousand pounds and it costs two thousand two hundred pounds it's uh, if you've got source equipment this is a magnificent amplifier it does all of the things that name amplifiers have historically done well and then gets rid of all of the things that made them quirky it, you now have inputs that you will be completely familiar with you've got din connections but you've got rca connections as well uh you've got enough power it doesn't have weird circuits that get confused by different types of speaker cable it is utterly viceless to live with um and the you know the results are that it it just it, it nicked the win in this particular test point because there were some fantastic amps that we tested uh up to three thousand pounds but th this one just about gets it especially when we move the RCAM across to being an all-in-one system because the RCAM works on its own and the name doesn't. Moving on, best hi-fi amplifier over £3,000. Uh, this was sort of new territory for us this year, but I found something which I thought had a bit of an AV swing to it. Krell's K300i um, is ridiculously clever for a high-end amplifier. There's always this tendency to sort of view high-end as <laughs> costing more and doing less, uh, but this really doesn't do that. Uh, you get HDMI switching, you get digital inputs, you get um, analog inputs as well. Uh, it can be controlled via UPnP. It does everything. And then it will also, just as importantly, drive any speaker within reason to the point where it falls to pieces um, because it has 150 watts into eight ohms, ridiculous current delivery. Um, it's built like a lorry and it sounds magnificent. It's not cheap. I'm not going to pretend that it's cheap um, in integrated mode with the, the digital board and, and the rest of it. It is now nine grand, but it does everything. I mean, this could also technically be classed as an all in one system if the fancy took, if the fancy took you. Um, and it, it was a delight to spend time with uh, and, you know, something where you could realistically replace if you were looking to down, move down from a multi-channel system, it will still handle a degree of HDMI work and, and the rest of it and then just sound magnificent whilst it does it. Um, if this is where Krell is going, I thoroughly look forward to it. Headphones. Uh, first up, we've got the one that you can win if you enter the competition, Philips Fidelio X3. Uh, this is a rare product because um, I don't think we've made much of a secret about this. A lot of the products that I review for you guys are things that I'll, you know, I'll say to Phil, do you think this will work? And he goes, yeah, or no, sod off. Sometimes he does that as well. But um, the Philips was, I was sort of told in no uncertain terms that I would be reviewing the Philips. And I'm very glad that I was told in no uncertain terms. That's because I sat in a room in, in January in Amsterdam um, headphones are not my thing as soon as i put them on and sight listening to them i thought okay okay no absolutely different. and um uh these are seriously good um and i i had a bit of a eulogy to phillips in the full length review which of course you can read on the site what makes these brilliant is that as well as sounding fabulous in some ways that's the easy bit uh, the way that Philips has separated the way that the drivers are mounted and then how it couples to your head is genius. And I, I don't use the word lightly. It, it is a genuine step change in how you make a truly comfortable home headphone. And because they're comfortable, you can sit there for hours and appreciate just how good they are. The, this is an, a, an absolutely sensational product. It's, it's Philips reminding people that when they feel like it, they can knock it out of the park. Loved loved every aspect of these. Um, a bit of a surprise, but a really, really welcome one. Uh, moving further on, uh, headphones, 5,000 to 2,000 pounds is not a headphone. It's an earphone. Campfire Audio, not a brand I'd had much experience of until 2020. Uh, the IO turned up. Uh, now, it's gone up since we reviewed it. It's gone up from 1,000 pounds to uh, 1,100 pounds. 
that's a lot of money for a pair of earphones. I make no bones about that. But they are unbelievably good. Uh, they're comfortable. They're supplied with enough domes to ensure that uh, pretty much everyone short of uh, the bloke in the Goonies is going to get a decent fit. Uh, they are incredibly easy to drive and they deliver a performance that just had me absolutely, absolutely bowled over pretty much from the moment I started listening. Uh, it's a weird thing in 2020 because, of course, very so few of us are commuting or going out into the world. But as and when we do, this is something that you can sit and listen to at home. And I did and be bowled over by what they do. And then you can take them out on the move. And thanks to the way that they fit, thanks to the way that they isolate, they'll go on delivering that level of performance um, when you're out and about. And no less importantly, they're very well made. They have an odd but very effective case made out of Portuguese cork. Um, and they're not so blingy that you're going to attract unwanted attention wearing them. They're just a smart pair of green earphones. Um, a genuinely, genuinely impressive product from start to finish. Then moving on, um, this was one I did run past Phil going, what do we reckon to this? And he goes, yeah, we'll see what happens. Um, this is the big one of the biggest surprises of the year t plus a german company uh when i was given the brief for this we've made a new pair of we've made a pair of headphones brilliant how much they cost five grand okay have you ever made headphones before no all right so it is a pair of five thousand pound headphones from a company that's never made a pair of headphones before but because of that they've approached certain aspects of how that they fit how they go together the materials used without any preconceived notions of what needs to be done and the result is the best pair of headphones i've ever listened to and not by a small margin either i mean you'd hope so it is a huge amount of money i'm not going to pretend otherwise but these are truly astonishing products if you um are in a space where it doesn't really matter what speakers you've tried they just won't dial in you've got you know if you're in listed properties with weird thicknesses of walls and unevens and suspended floors consider taking a step back binning the the, the, the conventional loudspeakers and looking at something like this because they will deliver a performance which all but the greatest of box loudspeakers can't get near and they'll do it regardless of the situation that you find yourself in they are monumentally good um thankfully we got a bit uh, less spendy for the next one best digital hi-fi product under a thousand pounds ifi audio zen dac uh, ironically ifi had to compete with itself for this competition because i looked at the zen dac and the zen blue bluetooth dac adapter um, and I gave it to the Zendak at a nod because I think it appeals to more people. Um, read the full review for a sense of context on this, but even a couple of years ago, what this product did at 100, does at £129 couldn't be done for several hundred pounds. And um, again, within a, a meaningful lifespan, 15, uh, 15 years, what it does at £130 could not be done at all. So it's an incredible product for the money. Um, sounds magnificent as a line level DAC. It's a surprisingly capable uh, headphone amplifier as well, even though there is now going to be a Zen headphone amp as well. Um, if you are shopping for your Re Rega IO and you think, oh, I need a digital source, it's a very, very good place to start looking. Um, moving on and up, best digital hi-fi product over a thousand pounds, the Aurelic Altair G1. Uh, this was a no-brainer because it does everything. Um, this is uh, a network streamer with an excellent interface. Aurelix Lightning is a tremendously well thought out platform. Uh, it's rune ready as well, if you want it to be. Um, if you don't want to have a NAS drive, you can stick a hard drive in the bottom of it and it becomes a server. You can use it as a line level product. You can use it as a preamp. You can then connect it directly to a pair of active speakers. Aurelic has genuinely given you everything except the kitchen sink on this one. Um, and they've done it without seemingly sacrificing any of the bits in, in, in performance terms. It's a superb product. 
it reflects the nature of this year's awards that you know we've only looked at two sort of pieces of source equipment or rather we've looked at other pieces of source equipment but there's only two awards for it because more often than not this is being absorbed into amplification and so on and so forth and this is for both multi-channel and two-channel if you are still looking at source equipment it's important to remember that source equipment is extraordinarily good so this is this is an outstanding product and um, one that will partner with with conventional amplifiers and, and deliver something a, a bit special while still saving on boxes because if you want it to be it's a server too uh, moving on i don't know where we go after um hi-fi product hang on uh, again my ability to remember what on earth i'm doing is um is limited thanks steve's next uh, Steve's one, yes. Wireless speaker under five hundred pounds. This is the only Steve's contribution to um to the to the hi-fi sector because it's the LG PN7 X Boom Go. My, my my contribution would be the one that looks so bling, wouldn't it? <laughs> uh, yeah. I mean, don't judge it by its looks. It, you know, it's no, not the prettiest no, piece. It's not the prettiest piece of kit I've ever seen. Right, and I can assure you, you can turn the lights off. But. <laughs> I got to say, it does sound really good. It does. Um, in, in no small part, thanks to DTS's um, Stereo Plus feature, which actually gives it a much larger sound stage than obviously you'd imagine, given that even, it's, it's relatively large. I mean, it's about this big, I think. But um, um, you know, obviously the speakers aren't particularly far apart, so you don't get much in the way. Of, you would, you, you don't expect to get much in the way of stereo imaging. But uh, I thought it's, I thought it was. Did you actually test it out, Phil, when you were filming? Yeah, oh, yeah. I've been, yeah I've, it's, 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 it's surprising, back, isn't it? <laughs> it's back in his box now. It's it's over there, back in his box. But I ran it for a few days and filmed it as well. And uh, I ran it as a background speaker. Switch mm. your lights off, stick it out with <laughs> you, and uh, and it's it's great. So you 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 think really that sounds as good as it does for. I think it's down to 99 quid at some places. It's, an, it's a steal. Some of the prices you yeah. can get it for. If you just need Bluetooth, um, and, you know, and please, uh, not being derogatory about that, Bluetooth is capable of great results, and this absolutely proves it. So, um, yes, and not the it's, prettiest it's, 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 it's developed in partnership with Meridian, so, you know, I can... They, yeah, yeah, yeah they well. know what they're doing. Um, so. It's waterproof, it's portable, it's, it's a great speaker. It's really? just a bit ugly. <laughs> The awards is more more than about outer beauty. It's so, not about um, looks, is it? It's not about looks. It's Although all about, all saying, performance. saying that, I'm going to say that the, the product that comes next, as far as I'm concerned, is still one of the very best bits of industrial design I've, I've tested in years. And I, I mean that about its predecessor and this one. Uh, best wireless speaker, £500 to £2,000. Name, Muso QB, second generation. Um, this is... <laughs> monument um I, as i say in the text the name xs3 gets a points victory in integrated amplifiers the muso qb2 is in one of the most hotly contested segments anywhere in the av sector and it still wins by miles it's ridiculously good now someone did say in the comments oh, i can't believe that you know the, they, they they raised some legitimate criticisms about how the original one sounded going oh it's the same product it really isn't. Uh, it's the same chassis, but the drivers have been changed, the amps have been changed, the DSP has been changed. <clears throat> the result is just a fantastic sounding product. Um, and it's a fantastic sounding product that has the best interface of its own, is Rune capable as well. It's Chromecast, it's AirPlay, it's Bluetooth. Uh, it's got additional digital inputs. You can change the color of it. Um, it even it, it comes with a remote control, which is a welcome welcome addition. This is stupendously good. Um, it takes it takes this category at a canter. Um, next up is a category that you know a couple of years ago we wouldn't have even believed existed. Wireless speaker over two thousand pounds. One of the most surprising things I've tested, and another very recent arrival to the site's reviews. Uh, the T plus A Caruso. I don't know what they put in the water at T plus A, but they go out and build products where you think that can't possibly work. And it does. It's a big cube. Um, and it's like the, in some ways it's like the LG speaker. It doesn't use DTS for this. You can close your eyes listening to it in front of you and you would swear blind that you are listening to a stereo, a genuine two position stereo product. It does things in terms of uh, stereo imaging and placement from a single chassis which is witchcraft more than that it is exquisitely well made 
Um, it's incredibly flexible in terms of the inputs and the connectivity. Um, it's got uh, a lovely interface. They've, they've T plus A's beefed up the app. They fit. They supply it with a remote control. Uh, they supply it with a remote control that you recharge the battery by USB. Why does nobody else do that? I mean, uh, sorry, that's something that's should be. A, it, it, now I've seen it. I'm going to. Who does that? Just. Well, okay, that's that's fine. Sorry, I, I'm in my own little hi-fi world. That's if Apple does it, that's to be well, commended. On the Apple TV, they do. But... Why does nobody else do it? I'm I'm sorry. I'm going to start marking people down for that. Now I've seen. <laughs> now I've now I've had this revelatory experience. It's a niche product. I said in the conclusion, T plus A knows that for three thousand pounds, if you want to go out and build a separate stereo system, um, you you will get something which does which can outperform the Caruso, but that's not what the Caruso does. It's a seriously clever thing. Uh, best newcomer. Uh, this is the first time that AV Forums has ever tested a Vertair product. Vertair is not a new company. They've been around for a few years, but the um, Dynamic Groove DG1 was the first time that uh, I've looked at, well, I've looked at a product and it's the first time that we've done it for AV forums. It doesn't look like anybody else's turntable. It looks it like someone's built a turntable out of the 2012 Olympics yeah, that's logo. That's just what I was thinking. <laughs> <laughs> I prefer to think that if Batman owned a turntable, it'd look like this. It's, it looks, it's, the, it's, it's the only turntable that appears to have a low radar signature. It's a genuinely joyous thing to look at, to use, and to listen to. And um, if you work on the principle that Vertair operates in the serious high end, just to reiterate, they make an arm, not a record player, an arm that costs £30,000. Um, this is just a, a taste of what they can do. And it's a magnificent one. It's the only turntable this year that kept the rig of playing the 10 honest. And... Um, for that, I, I say welcome to the fold, and we can't wait to see what they do next. How much was it, Ed? Uh, it is two thousand seven hundred and fifty without a cartridge, um, and you can have <laughs> all that money. And you don't even get the needle. Well, you could. They will supply you a needle for just. At the end of the day, you've still got a player record, which is going to get <laughs> scratched no matter how careful you are. <laughs> Pearls before swine, literally with you two all the time. <laughs> you know, do you an extra cart? They'll do you a cartridge, a uh, Verte brand cartridge for an extra hundred pounds, I believe. It's not not a significant amount Bargain. of money. <laughs> um, or you can go and choose. Like this is the joy of record players, as I have said on the on the on the site in the past. It's like building your own lightsaber. You get to choose your own bits, so you can fit. It, it it'll support cartridges up to and well past a thousand pounds. So uh, as far as I'm concerned, it's an excellent product. You know, you you Luddite, you Philistines can do what you like. We're not um, Philistines. We, I grew up with records, Ed, and you didn't. And I was glad to see the back of them when CD came along. All right. <laughs> you see, CD is Bloody the one hipster. I, CD is the one I detest. They 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 just go into my car to die. Before we get totally distracted, let's very quickly do product of the year, which I'm delighted to say is the Riga IO, uh, mainly because, as I say in the text. I, I don't want to sound like James May with his mysterious fizz, but there are certain products which intrinsically make you happy using them. Um, and obviously, some of the expensive products do that as a matter of course. Uh, of course, the Kudos makes you happy. It's brilliant, and it's now £8,500. The Krell is £9,000. It makes you happy. And, and the T, T plus A Solitaire, a £5,000 headphone, amazingly enough, makes you happy. The Riga does that at £380. It makes music more than just the business of replay it makes it an experience it makes it something where you go i want to listen to that again it makes you listen well past the time when you should have gone to bed and it does all of that at a price point which is i would you know 380 pounds means different things to different people but i'd say that that's not an unreasonable sum of money for an amplifier especially one made in the united kingdom well all i can say i just that <clears throat> you uh, you reviewed hi-fi all through the year like you normally do and not once in your list have I seen anything costing thirty-six thousand pounds. So well, well done. This is this. I mean, as I say, I, I like to think that you I am a man of trying hard enough. That's <laughs> uh, can I can I just undo some of this good work by saying that uh, it's scheduled for the uh, say I'm going to write it this weekend. The idea it goes up in the Christmas week is a um, a collection of bits that come to uh, twenty-four thousand seven hundred and twenty pounds. So that's my Christmas present to you. And if I'm honest, my Christmas present to me. 
Um, that that but, was just pure selfishness, Ed. You wanted that in, and you've just used it as an excuse to get it in. I maintain that actually there's a really interesting story behind it, and there's some. <laughs> some it, it's one of those things where, thanks to the unique way that AV forums works, where our reviews are visible for years afterwards, it's a valuable resource that will bring new people to the site. And that's my excuse, and I'm blooming well sticking to it. Here, here. Well, we're almost out of time. Well, we are out of time uh, yeah. for. Uh, for hardware, but just quickly, uh, Richard Sim asked, what's the difference between the PL7 and the PN7? If you can see them behind me there, uh, the PL sitting on top of the PN7 box, uh, basically it's, it's its size and... Um, They're different the, products, mate. Yeah, the, the, PL, the PL7 is like a log. It's like a, <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's like... It's like a, it, it, um... Yeah, it looks like a, like a log, like a Christmas log. <laughs> yes, it does. With the with the bass drivers at each end, and you can see them moving in and out when you're listening to music. Whereas the uh, the PN7 is is basically a plastic brick with two speakers in it and two woofers at each end. But and it sounds handle. amazing. <laughs> yes. But the sound uh, sounded, at the risk of sounding controversial, Richard, why don't you just go and read the reviews on the site? <laughs> Ooh. Ooh. And on that bitchy you note, know, we'll be back with software in a sec. Yeah, Tom might be back, but we're not going to him just yet. Yeah. <laughs> hey, sorry. Another cup of tea, Tom. <laughs> yeah, sorry, Tom. No, sorry. Sorry. I've got we'll one. To in we'll get to you in a sec. Uh, Ed's quickly going to do, because it's the end of the month, uh, album playlist and vinyl. Yes. Okay, right. Uh, album of the, month, of the week. Um, uh, most of you will have noticed that there's lots of Christmas releases. Now, as it's not December, a Christmas release can't, get the album of the week i'm sorry that i don't i actually i do make the rules um so album this week is uh cabaret voltaire's shadow of fear now cabaret voltaire uh founded in the mid 1970s they did a spot of punk they did a spot of post-punk they moved into um early electronic and industrial music then they disbanded in 1994 and now one man who was part of it is back calling himself Cab cabaret voltaire uh, Shadow of Fear, it might be fair to say it had a lasting impression on Tom. Uh, I think, some... Ed, if you're saying that, like, we can't have Christmas music in November, and I think that's fair, um, you have chosen the anti-Christmas music. <laughs> <laughs> yes, right. I need to be clear about this. This is firmly in the industrial end of things. Uh, but I, I thoroughly enjoy listening to it. I think it's creative. Um, it grabs attention sometimes unsettlingly so um it, clever use of samples loops so on and so forth i think it's a great listen it's on all the major streaming services uh you can feel free to uh, richly disagree with me uh, yeah i don't think it was i i i haven't once said that it was bad i don't think like it's well put together my goodness like that's not uh, the language you were using before we came back. <laughs> but boy oh boy is it bleak that yes. is bleak, bleak music. Uh, uh, music. And uh, yeah, a uh, lasting <laughs> impression is right. Like after half an hour of it, I thought I thought I was going to die. So, <laughs> well, what not, can I say? If, if, what, if, if that doesn't leave you intrigued to have a go, I don't know what will. Uh, right, vinyl. I apologise for this one. I think it's worth flagging because it's a magnificent album and I've been playing it heavily this month. But there is a caveat to this. This is an album by an Australian lady who uh, uh, performs under the name of Woods, uh, which is with an E-S rather than just D-S. The album is called Crystal Ball. And there's a bit of an on a punt to this because I've ordered this on vinyl. It hasn't turned up yet. The reason it hasn't turned up yet, you will notice in the link that Stuart has very kindly put next to me that the album costs £23. Unfortunately, it's only available from Australia. So um, it costs £23 to buy the album and £14 to ship it to the UK. And there may be currency charges as well. I may yet come in for customs charges as well. So uh, I, the moment... We'll definitely come in for customs charges. Cost me just quid. Cost me just under forty pounds so far for a record. Uh, I would suggest that you might want to try it on the streaming services first. But this is a lovely album. Um, 
there's shades of uh, Spot of London Grammar to it, Spot of Lapsley. Um, but she does all of her own electronic work with it as well. I think I th- I've thoroughly enjoyed listening to it. And I salute her commendable commitment to wearing armor which if you look at her instagram page she seems to wear all the time not just she should do the music for uh forge and fire i i would be all <laughs> i'd be all over that but no i uh, this is as much if you find the cabaret voltaire album a bit much uh you can listen to this in a digital sense as well so um well well worth a go i thoroughly enjoyed this uh playlists once again i'm afraid uh, streaming service playlists are a pretty much dead art form, but Cobuzz has been doing the music of different, the sounds of different countries. It's done Australia, which was dreadful, um, because it went on the poppy side. Didgeridoos and that sort. Of no, no, no. Uh, uh, on, on, in all seriousness, Australia's uh, Australian artists have done some outstanding things, but they, this is on the sort of Savage Garden end of stuff. Mm-hmm. However, Sound of Norway, you know, small population. They've cobbled together five hours of music from Norway, and it's brilliant. There's really, plenty of, really good. Plenty of black metal in there. There is a, a smattering of it, but there's a smattering of other sounds as well. I would also say that it only narrowly edged out the sound of Finland, which is mental. Um, so, yeah, the, the, those, those are my, my software choices for the moment. Okay, well, thank you very much, and uh, hope you're enjoying listening to the uh, Ed Sally podcast this week. <laughs> I noticed numbers have hovered lower than you. Know, so, you know, <laughs> uh, right. So um, yes, let's let's move on. Let's talk about film. Obviously, no film review or TV show review uh, this week because we're going to do end of the month. I'm not allowed um, to talk. I'm not allowed to talk this week. This is it. I've have I've had my ten words. And uh, bye, everyone. <laughs> See, if you're not going to talk, Tom. This is going to be a really quick last section. <laughs> <laughs> uh, obviously we're going to do end of the month this week uh, technically it should be next week because it's the second of december next week but no we're going to do um film stuff now so uh best film of the month i'm it's, trying to think if i've, if I've even watched that it's, it's, seen it's been films. a really dire couple of months in general i think um last month wasn't I think, so bad to be honest yet. tom it's been a pretty rough year as we have, cinema yeah <laughs> I think over the last like three months, we have been hitting the tail end of stuff that has been filmed and ready for post over over COVID. And I think we are now reaching the end of that um, stretch of content. Um, nothing new has obviously been filmed. Nothing. Well, OK, some things have been filmed, like we got the, the surprise Borat movie. But um, on the whole, big studios have ground to a halt. So we are getting nothing, absolutely nothing, except for Christmas films that were filmed last July. Um, so, yeah, film of the month this month is Jingle Jangle, which Kumari loved, uh, and I haven't seen yet, but I will watch it because I love Christmas crap. Um, but Obviously. there's just yeah. almost nothing worth even attention well, well, I mean, this month. If, you, if you're saying film. that, Tom, because normally I'm really picky about what I'll... <laughs> so in my case, there's not a lot to watch. In your case, if you're saying there's not much to watch, then uh, yeah, it must be pretty dire because you and Steve watch uh, film after film after film. I don't know where you get the time to do it. I really don't. <laughs> and Kaz, I don't know how Kaz does it. So Kaz doesn't sleep. I think he lives on caffeine pills. Yeah. Um, so yeah, it's just it's just been a diabolical um, diabolical month for for movie new movies in general. Yeah, yeah. That being said, there's been a heck of a lot of releases of excellent old movies. So um, I'd, I've noticed that, especially on their streaming services. I, I went on Amazon the other night, and I thought, oh, I'll watch that, and I watched this, and all. Uh, what else was was up there? A Parasite. I haven't seen Parasite yet. It popped up <gasps> on Amazon. Oh, you're in for a so, treat. Uh, Mm-hmm. Got to watch that as well. So um, I watched I... Die Hard too because <laughs> I bloody love Die Hard too. Why not? Yeah, I thought you said I've it was got... a Christmas film, Ed. It's not Christmas yet, according to you. I am able to watch it more than once. No, Die Hard's the Christmas film. No, Die, uh, so Die Hard Two's got snow in it. I feel it's just intrinsically. <laughs> Die Hard One's got snow at the end, huh? Isn't yeah, there yeah. snow at the end of the credits of Die not Hard One? Snow, it's paper coming down. Oh yeah. <laughs> <the credits>. yeah. <laughs> okay. yeah. Die, Die Hard. But it ends Christmas. with the song "Let It Snow, Let It Snow, Let It Snow." <laughs> Well, that, I believe it's so that, just Die Hard 2. One of Dino's so, finest. So best film of the month is uh, Die Hard 2. Let's just go with that. 
<laughs> best film? No, our best film of the month is uh, Lord of the Rings, The Fellowship of the Ring, because it's the best film of this month or any month. So uh, we'll have that one. Let's put that one up. Um, yeah. All okay. right. That's a, that's, a, that's a left field step, but okay. <laughs> okay, so uh, desk wise, um, what have you been watching? What have you been buying? I can uh, safely say, ain't bought anything. So. Oh, there's loads of stuff out this month, though. My oh my. There's um, so we've had King of New York this month. We've yeah, had uh, Total Recall this month. Well, you say this month. That came out on Monday. Yeah, it did. It's only just. It, but it's <laughs> I haven't month. even watched mine yet. <laughs> it's it's this month, and uh, boy oh boy, the Vendetta. That, that's yeah, worth it. absolutely. Loads of stuff that's like worth um, worth having in the collection uh, among a, a raft like uh, of mediocre UHD releases that we get. Like this month has been a month for actually decent Just stuff. Just get Come. your ass to Mars. And, yeah, you know, exactly. Or if you really want to go for it, the five disc um, box set of Dawn of the Dead. Yeah, also, that's which I also true. got. <laughs> oh, and have you opened it and experienced uh, it? I haven't opened it yet. No. Okay. Because <laughs> okay. it's going to take a while to get through all that. He's stuff. going to wait for his <laughs> Sony projector to turn up. You should have just yeah, segued effortlessly than... into. Yeah. yeah. But yeah, disc disc of the month has got to be Total Recall just for the just for the job that they've done on it. And uh, complaints, some minor complaints on the forums about how the uh, is the same bit, complaints. The bit around rate the, drops at three specific scenes, but yeah, I think they might be deliberate. <laughs> and and of course, you're going to get the the um, problem with the compositing of the old effects like that yeah that's just because of the film yeah exactly yeah that's you know at the root of the filmmaking people have been complaining about that and they're wrong to do so because that's just how the film was made that's like saying are they as long as the uh, the gorilla's rubbish in king kong haunts my dreams (laughs) it's fine (laughs) The thing is, Steve, no, the gorilla no, is rubbish in King Kong. He looks nothing not, like not it. In the, not in what, the... What, 1933 or 19, 1976 one? It's, just, it's Rick yeah, Baker it's in a suit. 76, you can tell it's anima, anima, animatronics, isn't it? Not even that. They built an animatronic ape, but didn't do anything. It just sat there like a <laughs> dumb shit. Most of it is Rick Baker in a monkey suit. Um, <laughs> 1933 King Kong, yes, yeah. it's stop motion animation, but it's, it's but, groundbreaking at the time. Yeah, of course. Cool. Was, of course, and, it's beautiful. I was just, yeah. I was just messing about. It's an amazing movie. Renounce your heresy. Yeah, of face course. the consequences. Yeah, complaining about a film's effects is pointless. I mean, that's that's just missing the point entirely. Uh, complaining you know. about an eighty-seven-year-old's film's effects is you know, <laughs> a low blow, isn't it? Really, you know? it's, I, I hate to break it to you, Tom, but the fidelity of some of the music releases from them is a bit limited too. So, no, oh, no, really. Yeah, sorry, oh, outrageous. Um, so yeah, uh, yeah, for for me. And for everyone in the world, the disc of the month is total recall. <laughs> so there you go. Ed did a spit take there. No, he... no, sorry. I, I, just I, 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 will, I will pick that up and I'll pick Flash Gordon up as well, but I'm waiting on the just a single disc coming out. I don't want the, the collector's box set. So I won't be spending fortunes on it. No. I, do you know what? I, I've, I'm quite famous. I've said before that I do like tat. I love, I love a box set full of tat, but even the total recall one sort of like tested my limits for tat i don't think i, I need any of that stuff yeah i didn't need there. two cds of the soundtrack I well <laughs> well exactly yeah i'm that's not a soundtrack well, that the, i need but the, the, the dawn of the dead box set includes a cd two cds of the um sound effects library that they use for the film <laughs> to be clear oh. hang on hang, can i just check um one of the things that was released this week is yet another version of Pink Floyd's Delicate Sound of Thunder. Yeah, it's the one I've I've got it it? already. It was in that massive box set that I bought last Christmas. So even though there was a perfectly serviceable version of Delicate Sound of Thunder... No, no, this is worth getting. It's uh, it's from the, it was filmed in eighty seven at the beginning of Delicate Sound of Thunder tour, um, and uh, it was shot on thirty five millimeter film. So, oh, so I was it, talking it about it the looks... music, but the, just the audio only version is is out this week of that remix. Oh well, I mean, that might be a remix based on the um, remixed um, because they did remix this. Remix they the remixed audio, everything the, in the hope that the, you would buy it. Yes, yeah, that I would buy it. Yeah, but I've already got and it because it's in the box set. <laughs> so, all right, I digress. Sorry. Right, um, <laughs> we've covered discs, we cover films. Not, not, not a great deal to talk about at the minute, but I think uh, TV is probably where we've been watching a lot of stuff. Mm. Um, 
I'll go first because it's nice and easy for me. Uh, Fridays are the day I look forward to because of lockdown and everything else. But Friday is a day I look forward to because I can sit and, and just be joyous watching The Mandalorian. And then after that, I can switch on Discovery and start shouting at the uh, projection screen and just waiting on Michael Burnham crying again or blubbing. Or, uh, she's done it every episode this season. Can I can I give a controversial take on this, which was, I think, episode... <clears throat> oh, I'm going to get my numbers mixed up. Episode four. Uh, without going into spoilers, it was about an intergalactic seed bank. It was the most Star Trek that Discovery, yes, I think, has yeah. ever yeah, no, been. That was actually yeah. bored of being a Star that. Trek episode. It was a... Yeah, there was a space anomaly. There was an away team. There was action from <laughs> yeah. the bridge. Yeah. It, it was almost like an episode of Star Trek. But the last two episodes, because the one before... Was the one before the one with the... Um... Uh, with the symbiont. Oh, I didn't like that. I didn't. Well, like that but again, that felt more Star Trek to me because it, it did because you had to was it the trill? rather than was blowing it, yeah. things up. <laughs> yeah, I guess. But yeah, yeah, it, 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 it's um, it's okay. It's you know, it's, it's not Star Trek. <laughs> if they didn't, it, it looks if they didn't nice. have to hug it out at the end of every episode, then it would yeah, be all no, right. that, that's that's what's annoying me. That, what's annoying me is her relationships with Saru and and her. She, she's got to break down at some point in every episode so far this season. She's been teary-eyed or whatever. And just, just like, yeah, okay, give it a break, Ben. Yeah, move on. Let's have a bit more action. Well, that you're really selling it to me. But uh, <laughs> no, I, I do agree with you. I have been enjoying The Mandalorian a lot. Mandalorian's just absolute perfection. Yeah, no, it's, it's, I mean, and I believe this <clears throat> Friday's episode is directed yes. by Dave Filoni. So I think we'll be seeing the, the live action debut of a Katana. Yes. Yeah, the yeah, the live action um um Katie Sackoff reprising her yeah, role. That was from, excellent. Yes. It was yeah. so exactly good. like she looked exactly like a Clone Wars character. It was perfect. That was that was awesome. Uh, if they want to do this rather than stupid films, I would be more than happy to just fill my boots <laughs> with their TV series. I don't know. I'm still looking out, I'm still looking for forward to uh I, I I'd like, you know a full from birth onwards biopic of Wedge. <laughs> I I just well, you know what I I'd, say, same, uh, I'd say the same happen. I'd say the same about Porkins Ed. I want to see I want to <laughs> I, no, I, I would also I would Porkins. also watch that uh, you know even in the full knowledge of just to, actually no do you know what it's the nature of the knowing the end that would make it such a rich tapestry. But what I've enjoyed is and I've I haven't done this with any Star Wars recently is actually go back and watch it again. Yes, you know when it's come to the films, it's like I watched once and then I, it. the only time <laughs> the only time I watched it again was when it came out in disc, and then I haven't gone back to it. Whereas, the exception to that being Rogue One, I, I have. Yeah, Rogue One, one. Yeah, I've watched that quite a few times. But this, I've kept going back and rewatching episodes just to find the Easter eggs. I'm, I'm going to rewatch them all at the end as a single sitting, which I did last time. But apparently, in Episode Four, there's, a, there's when uh, I think uh, Grief Cargo and Crar Cargo, whatever his name is, and uh, and um, Thar- Cara Dune. Doom, Cara Doom, was that mm-hmm. name? Doom. They're shooting in the corridor, and you can see one of the scripts I, standing. I, I had a guy with a jean screenshot. Yeah. yeah, someone did a, a fake uh, Star Wars, you know, action figure of him. Yeah, yeah. Oh, the, the memes have been brilliant it's this really week. Funny. Really. Yeah, they've yeah, been excellent this week. But yeah, and and the, I'll, there's lots of throwbacks as well. I know I've said this a few times, but uh, this week's episode, last week's episode, sorry. The number of throwbacks and and just little things like when they were on the speeder, you know, I'm not going to spoil it, but there's a, a bit where they're on the speeder and there's tie fighters behind them, and it's a trench run. Mm. You, know, you, you can almost see it as that, and there's there's actual shots within that that are, I know George Lucas used to say it's like poetry; it keeps repeating. Well, there were shots in there that you you just thought nailed it, absolutely nailed yeah. it. It fundamentally it just helps that after a significant time where characters were means of transport transporting you from one piece of cgi effects next they actually do care about the people mm. involved it, it, it's as, in some ways it's as simple as that um yeah so but i, I i'm gonna uh, wrestle this away from you phil because it, it's not not the greatest televisual mystery of the week which was uh, last night's MasterChef The Professionals. And you have to mm. hear me out on this because you, Phil, will be incredulous at this. But there was the most cryptic message um, that you can imagine for last night's MasterChef The Professionals. At the start of it, it said, this was filmed with four people, but we've edited one of them out. And it didn't tell you why. 
Also, um, I would love to have seen the face of the editor, like, right, you need to get rid of this guy. You need to I completely need to expunge this guy. Every shot from every camera angle they had, they had to do so much tight shots, Phil. They had to pull in every camera angle they had in order to cut it, cut around this missing contestant. Yeah, um, and, and he does very, I've checked, he does very quickly appear in tiny, tiny bits of him appear in the background. And we're wondering, essentially, it comes down to the, the question, is it, is this tragic? Has this person died? which I don't want to make light of at all, or more intriguingly, did they do something terrible? Been banged up. <laughs> uh, with, with, uh, it, could, it could be uh, like Sky's um, uh, program that they did recently, which was uh, join oh, well, they, and, well, and yes, they, they, they were going to do woodwork and so on. And what they didn't realise was that one of the contestants yeah, lately had, <laughs> had yeah. uh, you know, white supremacist tattoos and all sorts of... I don't know. I, Come my, on, how did you not pick up on that? My... I, I love it. Love it when he say he had is it eighty eight or something and and which apparently is code for eighty uh, eight is 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 is, is Hitler, Hitler, yeah. eight eight yeah. eight yeah. eight. Yeah. Um, but he said that that's when my dad died and he then the code with my dad goes I'm not dead. <laughs> <laughs> Um, one can, I just, can I just add one other? My favourite one is, um, if you've ever seen Come Dine With Me, there's an episode of Come Dine was, you know, because they take, I think it's over four or five nights, they all take turns hosting dinner. Well, the first two nights, there's this really annoying guy, and on the third night, he's gone. They caught him in the box doing coke, and, <laughs> and he didn't bring him back for the <laughs> following nights. He just disappeared from the episode. Um, one thing that was raised, Steve, between you and I having our WhatsApp conversation is, and this sounds outlandish, which went but, quite dark on my part. I'm sorry. Yeah, that it. was you, you. I'm not going to go there, Steve. You went. <laughs> don't, you don't, went. Don't you there. went. Eleven out of ten dark in about four minutes. Um, one possibility, and it sounds ridiculous, but it does strike me as just outside, just inside the realms of possibility, is that it was actually a known TV chef in makeup trying to. Oh, that would be brilliant. <laughs> trying to make it through um but no no it as i say they've given no explanation to why it is and obviously the rumor mill i mean in terms of generating coverage it's magnificent as i say there's a complete sun article on it um because nobody knows why this has happened and it's fantastic um I mean, even without that, it's still my television program of the month. It's my television highlight of the year. I absolutely love Marsha the Professionals. But nevertheless, last night's episode uh, took me to places that I didn't think that Marsha the Professionals could take me. So uh, there you go. All good. <laughs> I'm glad we got that off your chest, Ed. Yeah. Oh. Right. Tom, you're going to give us uh, something to talk about? Uh, yeah, a, like a, 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 real, a real neat bit of drama, something... Uh, original and unique and you don't get to say that very often about tv these days it's the good lord bird which has been airing on sky atlantic um it started this week or last week it's airing two episodes per week uh broadcast but they're all available on um catch up so uh seven episodes it is about uh john brown who's a real life abolitionist uh he was um a fervently religious man, a fervently violent man. Uh, lots of people, it's got a bit of a, a checkered past, historically speaking. Some people saying that he was insane. Some people saying that he was just... John Brown, the one with Harper's Ferry, is that? Yes. So yeah, the... he pops up in Flash for Freedom uh, and uh, uh, comes across as a raving loon. <laughs> He's yeah in popular conscious in, yeah the popular consciousness has him as being uh, an absolute nutcase. Although there's 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 doubt been cast on that in recent years as to whether that is um, an anachronistic view of him. But anyway, the this new show, uh, the Good Lord Bird, is about is about him and his um, journey from being a sort of known locally as being a crazy man, uh, white abolitionist, to the i don't uh, spoilers for history the disaster at harper's ferry um which sparked the american civil war arguably and the show for everything that i've just said the abolition of slavery the sparking of the civil war is hilarious it <clears throat> is outrageous oh, oh, uh, i watched this actually you sold me <laughs> yeah Ethan Hawke plays uh, John Brown. Uh, his, it's his pet project. He, um, he's written, co-written it and he's starring in it. And he's uh, produced it as well. And he plays John Brown. He can turn on a dime from being 
uh, extremely serious, uh, deep conversations about the inherent evils of slavery and the rights of man to literally foaming at the mouth, screaming in people's faces about the wrath of God. And he's, he's funny. He is funny as heck. And, and the whole, the tone of the whole show swings wildly from being massively depressing and horrifying and a chronicle of the horrors of slavery to this like slapstick uh, farce and um, it balances those two things insanely well and I can't recommend it highly enough. I'm not sure how long it's going to be on catch up for but definitely if you've got access to Now TV or you've got access to Sky then you should really. I, I got really momentarily excited here because I, I, he's not. The, I thought for a moment that it was about um, a different a- abolitionist, Cassius Marcellus Clay. You familiar, <laughs> familiar with this one? Okay, well, um, because Cassius Clay took his name from him. <laughs> yeah, but th- th- there are good reasons for this. Um, uh, he was at a um, uh, an anti-slavery demonstration in Kentucky in 1843, where his opponent shot him. Um, the large and ferocious Clay, who once frightened a rival into committing suicide the night before they were due to meet in a duel, <laughs> responded by pulling his Bowie knife. Despite having a bullet in his chest and being restrained by Brown's allies, Clay managed to cut off Brown's nose and left ear and gouge out his right eye. He then picked up Brown and tossed him over a wall and down an embankment. <laughs> Legend. I mean, and and, and at good. the age, at the age of ninety-two, Clay took on three assailants who broke into his home at night, shooting one to death, disemboweling another with his Bowie knife, and seriously wounding the third. He died Boy, of natural he, causes the following loved, year. He loved his Bowie knife, huh? <laughs> yeah, uh, uh, yeah. So but that yeah. guy needs a TV series as well. Can but I be that, clear about this? <laughs> right, right to Ethan Hawke. He will. He is well up for it. I bet. Um, but yeah, it's great. He he. Across the course of the series, you uh, you meet like all the icons of the uh, civil rights movement, including Harriet Tubman, who's like this uh, angelic, like vir- almost Virgin Mary type figure, which they they send up a little bit. And uh, Davy Diggs is Frederick Douglass. It's a very famous um, uh, man who he uh, escaped slavery in the South and became a, a civil rights advocate in the North. And uh, they are not afraid to skewer the sacred cows of the civil rights movement in a way that is not offensive. It is just supremely entertaining. So go and find it. Go and watch it. It's brilliant. It's one of the okay. best things of the year. All right. Steve, have you been watching I, anything? All I realize I've come to this extremely late, but um, I, I've been really enjoying The Crown. <laughs> Which, uh, okay. which, which uh, I've been That's watching my way through. Yeah, it's excellent. Uh, Matt Smith is so funny as Prince as Prince Philip. Right. Well, you know, better late than never. Um, <laughs> I mean, fucking. Hell, I, I, I can uh, safely say I'll never get there. Even I watched. You should, the crown. You should watch it. It's 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 uh, a fun fun trip through recent British history, post war history, basically. Yeah. Um, I'm not sure how you know you might skirt accuracy at times. Do you think beautifully <laughs> made? Uh, it looks gorgeous. They've spent some serious dosh on it, um, and also I'm slightly conflicted because I fancy Ginny Anderson, but she's playing Margaret Thatcher. Well, look, you and the rest of <laughs> it's just wrong. The, 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 you're you're conflicted because you fancy Margaret Thatcher, but hey. yeah, and I don't want to play by Ginny Anderson. <laughs> um, but, yeah. Uh, I'd just like to give a very quick nod as well to Taskmaster, which moved Channel 4. Uh, it started slow. Uh, it's picked up. I think that they maybe deliberately picked the tasks to start with that hadn't gone so well. It's getting better and better with each episode. Um, and the scene with the watermelon in a recent episode is one of the funniest things I've seen in many a month. It's iconic television. So if you haven't been watching that, it's all there to watch on For On Demand, along with all the previous series. As I've said on many podcasts, it's one of the greatest British comedy inventions of the last 20 years. Perfect television. Okay. Are we done? Is that it? Are we... Well, I mean, God, that, you can't argue with that. We've had a guest. Well, I hope so. <laughs> we've done, um, we've done awards. We've talked about lots of television, and it's only and Ed's minutes to still nine. sober. I'm not. As well, <laughs> right. well he's, he's able to put sentences together. Yeah, right. That's a different so, thing. So, so, so podcast that competition. 
Yeah. Why don't do that? Uh, Tom, you, you can do the podcast competition. Go on. Yeah, okay. I don't mind doing that. It's Again, it's to win a copy the of... Not so royal. <laughs> the Royal 3. Ish. For Yeah, you know, if you need a present idea for your mum this Christmas, then, <laughs> you know, maybe you want to enter it. I don't know. Uh, Emma's good. Anyway, if you want to win it... Which can... Emma is it? Is that the one with... Oh, it's the um... new one with Anna Taylor-Joy. Anna yeah, Taylor-Joy, yeah. It's good. Um... Mary Queen of Scots, yeah, Downton Abbey, who knows, who cares? Uh, anyway, <laughs> podcast exclusive Sell competition, <laughs> podcast exclusive. Uh, you could just use the following question to pick the right answer from the competition page, and it is seriously, which one of these movies is a spin off from a popular TV series? We really want to get rid of this set. <laughs> It's Emma. It's a spin-off from Cheers, right? <laughs> yes. Podcast Your exclusive. Steve. Exclusive. It's on its way to you, Steve, right now. <laughs> well done, Steve. I yes. want it. <laughs> uh, that's it for this week. So my thanks to Ed Selly. Uh, what came first, the music or the misery? Tom Davies. That's the worst flipping sweater I've ever seen. I actually like your sweater. And Steve Weathers. I want to date a musician. Uh, if you've enjoyed the podcast, then please uh, do give us a like and subscribe to the channel. I think we're one person away from hitting, hitting 95,000 subscribers. So why not hit subscribe? Oh, yeah, button? look at that, 94.9. Yeah. Um, Sounds also... like an FM radio station, doesn't it? <laughs> <laughs> one million by 21. One million by 21. We can do it. Yeah. Come on, people. Uh, right. You can also follow us on Twitter and Facebook. You can book back avforums.com for latest reviews, news, and video. Plus, leave us a five star rating uh, on iTunes and any other uh, service provider that, that you listen to us on that allows you to mark us. That's it for this week. My name is Phil Hinton. I had to read that, and we'll see you again next Wednesday. <laughs>